Welcome to Great Minds with Michael Medved. You can find us online at mindswithmedved.com. I'm Stephen Meyer. I'm the director of the Center for Science and Culture, and obviously not Michael Medved, but I have the great opportunity of interviewing Michael about his new book, The American Miracle, Divine Providence in the Rise of the Republic. We've been talking about uh, evidence of providence, which is kind of an odd thing to think about, but Michael's explained an interesting concept that, that if you see a series of very unlikely events that happen again and again and again and accomplish the same propitious outcome, you begin to be s- to suspect that something more than just chance or undirected process is involved. And you've used the example of, a, of drawing a straight flush n- a number of times and then your fellow card players first time think, well, maybe it was luck, but as you do it three, four, five, six times, if you win every night, they're gonna, the, the house is going to throw you out. They're going to suspect that you're cheating, that there's some design of some kind. And in American history, you've identified these uh, very unlikely coincidences, happy coincidences, that have a beneficial outcome for the advance of uh, the American mission. And, and a pattern of happy accidents is still a pattern. One of the things that I, 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 I like a great deal and helped to inspire me to do this book is a uh, lengthy quotation, which I have most of in the book, from Walter McDougall, who uh, is now a professor emeritus of history at University of Pennsylvania. And Professor McDougall says, try a thought experiment. Try a thought experiment. Imagine that uh, you could actually uh, go back in time and pluck someone from the year 1600 and move that person forward into our world. What would his reaction be? And he said, well, of course, he'd be amazed at our technology and our big cities and the growth and development. He said, but in terms of geopolitics, he would recognize the Mm -hmm. world. Uh, There was a nation called France that... um, was convinced of its own grandeur, though nobody else is. Uh, he would have recognized that from 1600. There was an Arab world that was... Islamic uh, Crescent. Correct, yeah, that was yeah. it, it, uh, engaged in war with itself mm-hmm. and everybody else. There was a Russia that was completely separate and was, as they used to say, the nation of the future, and it always will be. Yeah. Uh, and Authoritarian uh, Chinese empire. Yeah, yeah he yeah. recognized everything, yeah. except... He would not recognize the United States of America. How did this happen? Where did it come from? Right, because in 1600, the continent of North America was lightly settled. Mm -hmm. You did not have advanced Indian civilizations like you did in Mexico or in Peru uh, or in in South America. Uh, America would be a total anomaly. How did that happen? This would never have been predicted. There wasn't a single writer, even after they became aware of the New World, which was relatively late. Mm -hmm. Uh, When they became aware of them, no one would have predicted, oh, that North America, that's where a great civilization is going to emerge that is going to dominate the entire world and change the entire world. Let's talk about just the the settlement of America in the first place. You point out that there were some quite extraordinary and unexpected things that allowed the the, the pilgrims, 1620, to first get any kind of a toehold on the continent. And there was a striking passage in your chapter on this where you said they, they, they landed in the only place and met the only person in North America that would, that would allow them to survive there. Which, tell us a little bit about that. Right, because when they arrived, um, there had been a series of disastrous attempts to settle in North America, mostly at Roanoke, three mm-hmm. different series in the 1580s. And then the Jamestown situation where they had s- starving and cannibalism, and, and it, it, it was very, very difficult. They did hang on at Jamestown. But when they were coming to Plymouth, it was forbidding. And they initially had a very good plan. They were going to go to Manhattan Island, right? Because I didn't know that until I read your chapter. That, yeah, yeah fascinating. And they were, they were aimed for that, and they, they didn't— got blown off course. Way off course, 250 miles off course. And they ended up at, at Cape Cod. And this is one of those things where it's so miserable to arrive in Massachusetts with winter coming on. Mm-hmm. Because it's cold and it's wretched and it's miserable. And there's a narrative by uh, uh, Edward Winslow and uh, by William Bradford the, who were part of this little mission. They went on a little boat. The Mayflower is docked in the ice, you know, and, and they, they look, and it's, it's forest. There's, there's no 
place to, to build anything because they have to build in a hurry because it's getting cold and they don't have any food. And no welcoming committee, no correct. ends. No, and, and by yeah. the way, after they figured out where they were, they tried to go to New York, but the winds kept blowing them back. They, they couldn't make it. They couldn't sail that 250 mm-hmm. additional miles to, to get ba- down to Manhattan Island where they were planning to land. So in any event. So they start exploring in the area that they do land. Correct. And they find. And, and late, late at night, um, there's a gigantic wave that comes up. And they are convinced it's going to be their doom. And the wave comes up and blows their little boat, and they crash onto an island. And they're shivering on the island, and it's cold, and they're worried about wolves, and they're worried about Indians. They'd already had an unpleasant encounter where mm-hmm. Indians were trying to yeah, kill them. Right. Um, and then the dawn comes, and they look across from the little island, and it's Plymouth. And it's all cleared. And there are a series of little huts which are empty. And then they take their boat and they go and they land there. The Plymouth Rock is a myth. There right, wasn't right, a Plymouth right. Rock. And they go there and they, they check it out. And there's big storage bins of corn at, that is buried in the ground, which is going to be crucial to them. Their first thought, and I thought this was fascinating, was we have to find the Indians to pay. Mm-hmm. They, they want to pay. It turns out this was an Indian village which had been completely decimated uh, within two years, not by the pilgrims, not by by genocide, but right, by a disease. They think it may have been hepatitis or Mm -hmm. chicken pox Mm -hmm. or smallpox. It was one of those three. In any event, there was only one survivor from that entire village from that plague. Why? Because he had been kidnapped into slavery. He had been carried across the ocean, sold into slavery in Spain, by trappers or yeah, yeah. by by miserable yeah. s- slavers. There yeah. were people yeah. who were, and yeah. he was fourteen. Uh-huh. So he's taken over to Spain. Uh, he was then rescued, bought out of slavery by Franciscan monks, became a Christian. He wanted to go to England because he knew that the English were fishermen in that part of North America. So he finally hitches a ride back, and comes back. And his and village is gone. H- he's the only, yeah. So he goes to live with a neighboring village. And then all of a sudden, here's news. They're Englishmen who are at this village. And he comes and introduces himself. And he says, speaks and English. Says something about. No, that yeah. was his Samoset, who was yeah. a different okay. Indian. Oh, different Indian. Is, okay. yeah. yeah. Samoset said his first words. He had also learned English. Okay. He said, uh, uh, Welcome. Do you have beer? <laughs> Do you have beer? <laughs> the first okay. words spoken in English to yeah. welcome the pilgrims. And they did. They did. And he was happy with that. A Squanto, who, Tisquantum was his, yeah. his name in Indian, but he's called by the pilgrims Squanto. They thought this was a miracle. This is the one guy, Christian Indian already, knows English, spoke pretty good English, and is there to help them and moves back into his old home village and welcomes these newcomers in his village and, then, and is there for the first Thanksgiving. And then, as you tell it, he uh, uh, begins to introduce them to the neighboring tribe, negotiates Correct. He ne- negotiates a, peace alliance. with them, right, yeah. because he had been living with Massasoit, right. who was the, the uh, Wampanoag uh, chief. In any of the whole thing is completely it's bizarre if, if because were, there's if nobody else. It were a Hollywood script, no one no, would believe it. It's no, there's contrived. no one else in North America who's more useful to them. Yeah. Now, here's the fascinating thing. We I just all said learned, it. it's, it's, it's contrived. Right, but, but not by the, the right, screenwriter. but not by a screenwriter. Yeah. The screenwriter, yeah. you know, yeah. and and the, of course the pilgrims knew it, and they they acknowledge it. Deeply religious people. Here's the amazing thing. Um, one of the things that's always puzzled historians is uh, William Bradford records in his diary that Squanto showed them how to uh, plant corn by taking a dead fish and putting it in with the corn seeds. A fertilizer, mm-hmm. and it worked wonderfully. And he's very grateful, and and he, he thanks Squanto. One of the problems is all the historians have tried to look at the Indian tribes who live in that area. They didn't know that. Where did he get it? There is a recent book uh, called 1491, which is uh, I have it, yeah. Uh, where he says, look, what's very obvious, and the historians have concluded, when Squanto lived in England, he he, he learned, learned he it. learned about it. It was a regional culture in England that he, he was the one person the world. brought it to the New World and was able to help the pilgrims survive yeah. their first devastating yeah. winter yeah. where almost half of them died anyway.
but they would not have lived and they could not have had a successful settlement as mm-hmm. they declared without this one individual. Unbelievable. Let me let me give you a quote to react to. Sure. I'm you know listening to this also through the ears of um, skeptics who would think that the pilgrims were superstitious and seeing mm-hmm. these things as the hand of God. They were praying people. Their prayers seemingly were answered in the most improbable way. What were they to conclude? So there's a way in which from their lights, by their lights, they were rational. But from a skeptical 20th, 21st century point of view, we think of this as superstitious. But there's a scientist that wrote something in the Wall Street Journal recently. He was caricatured by Dan Brown, who has a new novel out, uh, which is uh, making us, he has a, a protagonist who's making a case for atheism. And he actually uses this scientist, Jeremy England, who's at MIT, um, names him by name. He's a real scientist, and he uses the work that England has done to sort of support the narrative that science supports atheism. Yeah, I saw that and, piece. I'd yeah. love to talk to Dr. England. He's an interesting guy, and he, he wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal saying, hey, don't use me to advance your atheism, because that's not what I believe. It turns out he's an Orthodox Jew, who believes in God, and he says this. He says, humans will always face a choice about how to react to the unknowable future. Encounters between God and the Hebrew prophets are often described in terms of covenants, as they were with the, the, the Puritans and the pilgrims. Partly to emphasize that seeing the hand of God at work starts with a conscious decision, decision to view the world in a certain way. Consider someone who assumes that all existence is the work of a creator who speaks through the events of the world. He can follow that assumption down the road and decide whether God seems to be keeping his side of the bargain. Many of us live like that and feel that with time, our trust in him has been affirmed. It seems that this is the kind of thinking that the, the pilgrims were doing. No, it's, it's a wonderful quote, and it's one of the reasons that, um, you know, this is my 13th book, yeah. and I, uh, this is the one with all my heart that I, that I care about and I'm proud of, and partially because it's one of those things that I've learned in my life. I, I conclude the book, the last chapter, has this completely out-of-left-field anomalous story of how I met my wife, and uh, we've been married 32 years. It's I, I am blessed beyond measure with my wonderful wife, who you, who you know. We've been privileged to know you guys, but I didn't know that story of you meeting her at the beach. So. Correct. <laughs> and, and, and again, the odds are against it. If I, go to the, if I go to the beach on that Tuesday afternoon yeah. in Santa Monica, California, if I go to the beach a half hour later, uh, we have three children and a grandchild who don't, don't exist, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, because we don't meet each other. And the, the, the idea here is that, okay, you can be deluding yourself to think, oh, well, this is a happy accident, that there was some higher power that brought us together, which I believe with all my heart. But believing that is better for a marriage. Believing in our divine favor that, that has give, is better for a country it, because it does create that sense of obligation, of nobility, that we're not just here. And, and this is one of... It, this comes to contemporary politics. It's not America first. It's not, oh, we want to win, 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 win. It's America serving the world. The, the idea that this country was created for a higher purpose, to, to raise the state of man and to reduce suffering mm-hmm. around the world, which we have manifested. To advance the cause of liberty. It was very simple. Yeah. I, I, yeah. One of the things that I, I talk about in my work a lot in, in a previous book I asked about is the Bedford Falls experiment. It's a thought experiment. Bedford Falls is a reference to everybody's favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where George Bailey, to try to appreciate his importance, he's given a vision of what Bedford Falls would have been like if he had never existed. And the town would be squalid and it would be ugly and there would be meanness. And it, it's a much better place. Do a Bedford Falls experiment about America and the world. What would the world be like today, Mm -hmm. except for the United States of America rescuing planet Earth from the incredible evil of communism, of Nazism, of chaos and disorder, and now in the process of rescuing the world from the impact of Islamic fanaticism? Mm -hmm. Um, I I do think that, that that the destiny smiling on the United States should increase our sense of purpose and Let, obligation. Excellent. Let's go back to another aspect of the founding, not just the discovery of the continent and the establishment of, of uh, the colonies in the first place, but I was really taken by your chapter on uh, titled An Assembly of Demigods about the Constitutional Convention. And there were some extraordinary things that happened there that 
I think, support your thesis as well. And things, many people think that the Constitution was almost an automatic outcome of the revolution, but it was in no way um, uh, expected or, or, or predictable. Can you talk about some of the things that made sure. it so un, un, well, well, first of all, that, that phrase, an assembly of demigods, yeah. was a phrase from Jefferson, who wasn't there. Mm -hmm. He was in Paris watching it. And by the way, he had a lot of people he didn't really like very much who were there at the federal constitution, and he wasn't even sure that they needed a strengthened federal government, which is why they were there. Uh, but when he saw what they had produced, he said, surely this must be the work of an assembly of demigods. This is Jefferson, mm -hmm. right? I, big religious skeptic. Yeah. And there were events in the Constitutional Convention. One of the things that happened is it was hot in Philadelphia. I, I don't know if you've ever been in Philadelphia in the summertime. It's, it's humid. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's yeah. awful. And they had bugs then because one of the things we've done is we, they had apparently these horrible mosquitoes. And, of course, you couldn't – they didn't have screens yet. No one had invented mm -hmm. them. And so in, in the rooming houses, the people would be up at night and they were miserable and they were fighting – and the, the Constitutional Convention, and we know all of this because James Madison kept very, very careful notes, they were on the verge of dissolution. And then a couple of things happened. And it, this was over the issue of the, the small states versus the big states Correct. and the representation in the legislature. Correct. The kind of issue that we argue about yeah, today. Yeah. Should, should, should the small states have disproportionate representation right. or should everything be done by population? Mm -hmm. And... Of course, they ended up splitting the difference. One House yep. of Congress, right. one way, one House. Okay. But at the very point they were about to break up, there was a break in the weather. And all of a sudden, the weather turned cool, and there was some rain, which they desperately needed. They started getting and, some sleep. Right. And a number of people yeah. said that in itself made a difference. And then Benjamin Franklin. That's the other thing I want you to ask about. I was so, I've, I've heard, I've read little snippets of that speech before, but you had the entirety of it in there from Madison's notes. I, Correct, which is, which is so extraordinary. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin generally uh, did not speak because he was an old man. He was 81 yeah. years old right. and he could barely walk. And he would hand his handwritten right. notes to right. James Wilson, his fellow Pennsylvanian, who would then read it. Mm -hmm. But this one, he stood up himself, and he delivered it. And the reason we have it, he didn't write it in advance. James Madison is scribbling notes. And he talks about the power of prayer and how they have to begin praying together. And I think this is fascinating. It's so classic. And he says, we surely should now pay the money and bring a pastor in to begin our sessions with prayer. And they looked at each other. They ended up not doing it. And not because they thought it was unconstitutional or a bad idea. They thought it was a good idea. And they all agreed that they would go and pray together that Sunday. They didn't have the money. <laughs> and they didn't want <laughs> to go it, into it death. Cha it changed the atmosphere in the, in the meeting. Completely. And, and, and then there are other things about there's the most mysterious member of the Constitutional Con Convention was a bachelor, yeah. elderly guy like Franklin yeah. named Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer. And... He, he lived alone. He, he left, by the way, his library to his friend James Madison. But in any event, it's very complicated and tough to explain. But he takes he, this unlikely walk. He walks out because by leaving, he would create a tie vote that would allow the small states to stay in the Constitutional Convention. Otherwise, there is no Constitution. So, and again, People at the time, I have He was like, a big state guy who absented himself in order to help the small states because he knew it was for the greater good. Is that, correct. Yeah. Well, he, he was actually a small state guy who absolutely... Uh, Aligned uh, with the big state. Correct. Yeah, yeah. But in any event, it happened. And this is the point. I, I quote five different members of the Constitutional Convention, yeah. all of whom said it was God, uh, yeah. that there's no rational way to explain, yeah. including Alexander Hamilton, yeah. Yeah. who, again, is not... A, well, Franklin's yes. prayer was the thing, or appeal for prayer was the thing that struck me most because, like Jefferson, he had a reputation of being a more enlightenment, Correct. free thinking guy. Correct. But he's quoting from the Gospels, saying, you know, if a, if a sparrow can, falls, if even a pharaoh, if give it, me the quote. If, yeah. if a, a sparrow cannot fall without his care, uh, can an empire rise without, without his, his blessing? Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. And uh, and it's it's extraordinary that I use that as the epigraph in the book, and uh, we need to come back to that spirit of cooperation and gratitude. Wonderful place to stop. 
Thanks for listening. This is Great Minds with Michael Medved. You can find us online at mindswithmedved.com. And we'll have more programming like this with future blogs, uh, maybe even another interview on this book with Michael. Thanks for watching.